Well, hi, everyone. Welcome back to another episode of Speed Tips by Bob and Chad. Tonight, we're joined by our special guest, uh, Joel Smith from Close Racing Supply out in Eldridge, Pennsylvania. Um, what's new and exciting at Weir's Machine today, Chad? Oh, just another Monday here. We had some troubles today, so, uh, you know, every day is a new adventure. We're uh, uh, air compressor troubles today, so we, we're we actually shut down until tomorrow when they come to fix that. I see. Um, you know, that's one, one problem with being in manufacturing. If you're broke down, that's uh, very aggravating, but tomorrow's a new day, so we'll, we'll figure that out. But supposed to go racing last weekend. We were supposed to have Weir's Machine Night at Fountain City. That got rained out for the second year in a row, so probably not going to schedule any more race nights for Weir's Machine. Awesome. Well, Joe, tell us about what's, uh, well, first tell us about Close Racing and and give us some history about you and the company and all that good stuff. Close Racing has been around for one years now. Originally, it was started by a, a late mile racer by the name of Bob Close. That's what the Close name came from. Um, I've worked for since 2000, 22 years, I guess, and I uh, purchased the business from Bob um, about eight or nine years ago. Um, actually, recently, when I say recently, about three and a half months ago, I moved to a building down the road from our old location um, on us to, to have more. Um, um, then it sounds like, bad for you, Joel. Yeah. We're having trouble with your sound and your system. I'm wondering if you wouldn't be better off to log off and log back in. Or shut your is your cell phone running on your Wi-Fi there with you? And the Monday can it continues. <laughs> <laughs> Technology, man. Yeah, it kind of sounds like some Wi-Fi interference or something. Well, we were good to go up until we actually launched live, and I don't know what happened. Um, go ahead, like I said, go ahead and log off, and then log back on. See if that helps. Yeah, I know when I'm here, I always shut my phone off. When we first started, we had some issues with that, but yeah, well, that was the shop's Wi-Fi was really bad. Okay. So we got a couple questions popping. You see them already? Um. Yeah, actually. Um. Questions right off the bat. Uh, first one, Dan. I asked last time about running the right trailing arm in the top hole on the bird cage and the second hole on the frame chassis. You said you need bar angle, USRA B mod, left rear bar static with driver 22 degrees, right rear bar 13 at 11 degrees. Um, well, I mean, that's that's plenty of right rear bar angle i mean when the racetrack's heavy you're going to need that bar angle um when the uh, racetrack gets slick depending on the horsepower that you have you might uh um you might not want all that angle in there so how are we doing joel can we hear you now yeah can you hear me yep oh i got you all right you think we're good now? Ex all right. Let's explain all that info to us again. <laughs> all right. So everybody missed that. So um, Bob had just asked me uh, give a little info on close racing supply. Um, and 
CRS has been around for 26 years. Uh, originally, it was started by a late mile racer by the name of Bob Close, successful regional uh, racer uh, here around the area. Um, and I started working for him about 2000, which would have been 22 years ago. Um, and then I purchased the business about eight or nine years ago. Um, and just about three and a half months ago, we moved into a, a new location, a uh, large location uh, on a through more inventory, um, hire some more employees and, and be able to take care of our customers better. And, and, and that's our goal at the end of the day. Yeah, we got to see that when we went, when we had the race tech intro uh, school out there, we got to see the new building. That's quite the facility you have there. Yeah, it's working out pretty well for us so far. So tell the customers, and of course, uh, you know, you're, you guys run a lot of UMP type stuff out there. Uh, you know, but basically tell, tell everybody what you actually do and where you service. And You know, we, we've kind of grown to the point where we, we take care of uh, customers all over the country, uh, much like you guys do. Um, we, there's a few things we specialize in. Um, we build a lot of upper controls, um, some suspension components, and we build. Um, and uh, take care of a lot of my stuff, the UMP mods. Um, our area is bigger UMP modified stuff than it is IMCA. IMCA is kind of weak in this part of the country. Um, uh, and then, uh, of course, that super loud race on your crate late model pretty big six so four crate motor late model cars uh this area um and then we have two versions of classes uh the number of cars we're losing your connection again joel i don't know why that's happening yeah do you have any other computers on that are Wi-Fi? Um, yeah, sometimes I know when we used to do this at the shop, we had to shut everything down because Wi-Fi wasn't good enough. Uh, next question is uh, Ryan Smith running a Lasota. Ryan is running a Lasota modified, and this year we started running a half-inch bump on the right front. I didn't change much of the car besides that, and I had the nose push had the nose push on me on exit. Does that mean I need less aggressive bump? Well, what that actually what what that, that actually is telling you is that the car is over on the bump to the point where the, the, the right front, in answer to your question, yes, I would say you probably need a less aggressive bump. Um, or you need to adjust the car accordingly and take um, a little bit of left rear traction out of it because, of course, with that bump in there, it's, it's putting it to the point where it's gaining more traction. What's your opinion, Chad? Yeah, that a half inch bump stop's really hard to tune. You know, if you if you got too stiff of one there, it's it's just going to be probably too aggressive. You, you probably need something pretty soft, like a foam half inch, if you're going to run a if you're going to try and run it. You know, in my opinion, the half inch bump stop it's so hard to tune. You'd be better off to just ignore it and not run it, or just run a really hard one at the bottom of the travel and not even engage in it until you're you know, right there. I'd rely more on the spring rate than I would a, a tiny little bump like that. Yeah, you'd almost be better off to run a taller, a lot less softer one that would uh, uh, compress more. But that's just my opinion. I, you know, haven't had a tremendous amount of experience running bump stops. And uh, uh, so that's my opinion anyway. Uh, Joey says he can hear you all. Okay. Pat, our old buddy Pat, um, says Bob Close was one of my first customers and a great guy. Um, you know, Bob was a dealer of ours for quite some time. 
I never actually had the privilege of ever meeting Bob Close. Um, I've heard lots of great things about him, and, and uh, um, so that's awesome. How are we doing there, Joel? Can you hear me now? Uh, I can hear you now, I think. I, I turned my and things Hope that does. Um, not, not doing it. Uh, let's see what uh, Tracy. What's a good load number for a fifty-pound left rear spring? You know, it's it's back to that. It's back. It's back to that. Uh, uh, it's back, it's back your own notebook type thing, but an actual good load number uh, that, you know, ha having a, a preload of probably 200 pounds with that 50 pound spring is probably pretty good, but that's going to be pretty much coil bound. Uh, you got to be careful when you get that soft because, you know, spring's not going to take a whole lot. And, and the problem is, is by the time you preload it to do what it's supposed to do, you're going to coil bind it. Once you coil bind that spring, all of a sudden now it's going to start to unwrap. And which the more it unwraps, the softer it gets. Joey says uh, he needs a few front bumpers. You must have raced this weekend, huh, Joey? Uh, I know we shipped out a fair amount of them today. I was uh, looking at all the big boxes that they <laughs> sent out, and I'm thinking, wow, people must have raced. Uh, sport mod switching from a 13 inch to 11 inch right rear same spring rate what's the reasoning and what does it do to the car well when you go softer on or when you go shorter on that spring it's going to change the spring table on that car quite a bit and what's going to happen is, is it's going to actually roll to the right rear a whole lot more normally as a rule of thumb Whenever we went to that 11-inch spring, we've had to increase the rate. So, like, if you're running a 225, we've had to increase the rate to, like, a 250. The thing that I'd, I'm not a huge fan of that 11-inch spring because it doesn't have a lot of coils. And uh, so that in itself kind of tells me, you know, sometimes I don't know if we get the travel that we would like to get, uh, but, but that's kind of the rule of thumb. Uh, I think I already answered the question on the... Yeah, I was a double. Okay. Ryan, this one's for you, Joel. Joel, do you still sell yes. your fiberglass... rod body braces and ends to go with them sure sure do yes in stock okay uh josh hey guys thanks for doing this on a sport mod the track is pretty rough and um the track is pretty rough and the right front's bottoming out a tad should I a guy raise the right front a couple turns or maybe stiffen the spring 25 pounds um, probably I'm not a huge fan of raising the right heights much uh, I'd probably lean towards trying that stiffer right front spring um, as, you know in, in that heavy t conditions the other thing that you could actually do is go with a, uh, on a, on a rougher type racetrack, you could go with a, a stiffer compression right front shock. Uh, that would actually be my first choice is go with, like with a heavy rough type shock. Um, normally that would be like a five compression uh, valve shock for these rough conditions. Then you find you don't have to change the actual car itself. Because when you stiffen the right front spring, you're changing it. You're changing how the right rear works. You're changing corner entry, mid corner, and corner exit. 
where with the shock absorber, all you're doing is you're slowing that down to the point where it won't affect you much uh, getting in. Talk to my old buddy Pat last week in Marshalltown. Um, talked about his new deal. Everything seems to be going pretty good, and, and uh, he was all chipper, and and and, and, and so uh, that was exciting. So glad everything's going well, Pat. Uh, what does moving the radius rods on a three-link USRA car do? Moving them up, down, and forward and backward on the cage. Well, I'm not a real big believer in moving them forward and backward. Uh, I think that changes a lot of geometry. Moving them upward, um, now like that street stock type car that you guys build, you've got quite a few holes and you can move that stuff forward and backward, can't you, Joel? What does that actually do? Yeah, can you guys hear me now? Oh, well, we can hear you. I don't know what I'm struggling with, but my super. One, if I come back for a second, I found a hacker, pro factor, there's the whole stability. You know, we built it really for, well, before, so we can go different Joel. Yeah, we lost you again, Joel. Yeah. Um, turn your turn your volume down. Are you on a computer or on a, your phone or what are you on? A laptop. Turn the volume down. I can try a phone, but on a laptop right now. Turn the volume down. Turn the volume down. Yeah, sometimes a loud volume interferes. Uh, anyway, Matthew is moving them up and down. Uh, when you move like the left rear up, you're gaining angle. Uh, it's kind of like the car getting up on the bars. Um, you know, statically on, on our on, a, on an IMCA type car, we'll run 25, 28 degrees on that left uh, left lower bar just to keep more angle in it. And to the point where we kind of learned that a little bit off of the four bar stuff, that when you're all up in high motion, where like if you clamp the right front down and you jack the car up against the chain underneath the seat, you'd find that you have about 45 degrees of angle. And that seems to work really pretty well. Um, the right rear, uh, I move that up, put angle in it if I need to free the car up. And if I need to tighten the car up, I actually lower it. And then one thing with the, the right rear, we actually raise it on the cage itself, uh, keep the angle in it, raising it on the frame and raising it on the cage because the timing of that thing seems to give the car more traction but still keep the angle in it to the point where it, it doesn't uh, uh, affect the car in the middle of the corner. Okay, let's talk tire grinding do's and don'ts. Oh, don't well, make smoke. Whatever, yeah, whatever you do, don't make smoke. That's one thing for sure. Um, the biggest thing is, uh, of course, always grinding in the direction that the tire is actually going to go. In other words, if you're doing a right tire, you would grind it standing in front of the tire you would grind around in the circular motion. The left tire, you would want to stand behind the tire and grind around it so that you're not cutting off the uh, sharp edges and, and you're, you're creating edges to go, yep, there you go. Chad's got a diagram there. So you know go ahead want, with that, Chad. This is so hard to, to show, but. So as the tire feathers, right, it feathers that edge, you grind that back square 
don't don't grind towards that feather because you're just going to roll the feather down into the crack and not sharpen that edge so you always want to sharpen your your edge um and when, the biggest thing is just don't get don't use too much speed don't get too hot i mean if, if the tire's smoking that's a definitely don't do um I'm not a big fan, you know, now that we can actually sipe these tires, you know, I use that 32 degree grip. Um, that seems to work pretty good. Um, when we, when we don't, uh, um, how are you doing now, Joel? I'm trying again. How's it working? Well, you're sounding good, at least for a split second. Uh, the question that we're on is we're talking about, uh, let's talk about grinding tires, the do's and don'ts. Uh, we talked about the fact of when you grind the tire, uh, the right side tire, you always want to stand to the outside of the tire grinding around. And the left side tire, you want to stand to the inside of the tire grinding around. So you, you make the tire have some sharp edges towards the outside edge of the tire. Um, anything you want to add to that tire grinding? A lot of customers want to ask me about that tire prep is, you know, there's there's no there's no magic there, but but I always tell people, you know, watch what the guys running up front are doing and ask them what they're doing. And, and as you, uh, get some experience with it, you'll find what works best for you. You know, it's it's not always the same thing. I mean, you know, you know, as you're on other guys, cars, tires, you know, yeah, how you're going to type for him for his application. Gotcha. Uh, next question. Stefan's got a question. I have a 3,200 pound stock car with cross wedge, cross wedge and left all around 53.5-54%. My rear bite is about 250 pounds on a big half mile. I struggle to get the car, get the car to turn in and through the center of the corner, and it's a tick free off. Um, I know I know it may be a loaded question, but where do but where or what changes the, should I be looking at making? Well, I mean, I, as far as your actual left side percentage and your rear percentage it doesn't sound all that bad. I think you've got a little bit too much left rear i mean that's quite a bit in, in, in my opinion uh biggest thing is is you know the question you got to ask yourself if the car is um, where or what anyway if the car um is getting in and it's rolling on the right rear that's creating your 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 tightness condition getting into the corner and through the middle so kind of it all depends on how much travel you're getting on that right rear you're just probably getting a lot of side bite on that right rear um your looseness off is because the car is tight from the center it big it's tight on corner entry and through the center and then what happens is is the car automatically breaks traction getting off and then, then you have no traction getting off whatsoever but um think about it when you're actually racing the car if you can kind of feel you know if, if your shoulders kind of pushing towards your back and leaning a little to the the left when you're in the seat even though you're struck strapped in there you know kind of feel if the car feels like it's getting on the right rear or have somebody take some pictures or video tape to see if the car is actually getting on the right rear on corner entry uh, if that's the case, then you know you, you could probably use a little stiffer spring over there, or, or uh, a softer left front spring would work well too. Uh, Bob, question on mounting the left rear chain on the axle of an A mod with 60-inch center axle. Where does the chain 
mount side to side up against the bell or out towards the birdcage. If you move positions, what effect does it have? I'll let you take that one, Chad. So generally, uh, we like to be in towards the bell uh, on the modifieds. And if you just, if you think of that, the rear axle as like a teeter-totter, okay? So if you put that chain way out by the tire, it's going to pick that up real easy. If you put it in here, it's going to have less effect on it. So essentially, when we move it into the bell and the right side goes up in the wheel well, it actually digs more too. So if the chain's tight out here, you're going to get less dig past the chain. If it's in by the bell you're going to get more dig, left rear dig off the corner uh, if the chain's moved into the bell. And it doesn't try to pick the left rear tire up so so easily when it's slid into the bell. So I always want to go tight to the bell. Uh, next question is uh, three-link B-mod. Do you prefer to keep trailing arms same length or run a left rear shorter to get more rear steer or keep the same length but run more angle to toad in i have a 15 inch and a 16 inch 15 inch left rear and a 16 inch right rear with three inches of steer at hike from static well that's not too bad the biggest thing you're going to find with your left rear yeah steer is part of it but when you get into the corner and the, and the car tractions up, when you get on the throttle, that left rear is going to traction the car up quicker in the middle of the corner, which sometimes can create a throttle tight situation. Um, I've kind of always went the opposite with a longer left rear. That way I can run more angle in it and it doesn't seem to be as sensitive in the middle of the corner. And I feel the longer one actually tractions the car up better up off the corner. That's just from my experiences. Um, you know, not saying that this wouldn't wouldn't work. I know some guys have done that. Kind of depends on the tire you're running. And if you're on short race tracks, you know that 15 inch probably is a pretty good idea. You know, if you're on something that's three eighths or bigger, you know, you might you know try a longer left rear to see. But maybe you're not having that mid corner problem. If you're not having that mid corner problem. I, I would leave it alone. Three inches of steer uh, from static is is a fair amount. Um, that, that that definitely should get the car free through the middle, I would think. Um, Trace, when a car is tight in the middle of the corner, where would you adjust first? Well, there's two questions. If it's tight in the middle of the corner, is it tight on the throttle or is it a side bite deal? If the car's tight in the middle because it's rolled on the right rear and you've got quite a bit of side bite, then more than likely that might be a panard bar adjustment. Raising the panard bar on the rear end might be the answer. If it's tight on the throttle, then you need to actually like raise the right trailing arm uh given it so that it's got more steer on that right rear so that right rear moves backwards a little bit better it helps rotate the corner a little better i'm not a big believer in taking traction away from the left rear i'd rather add traction to the right rear and, and putting some angle or more stagger uh, one of those two things would be uh, my go-to there um, Brandon, the legend Joel Smith, Brandon Blocklanger. There's a guy we need to get back to the track. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. He's just living the dream, family man, enjoying everything. You gotta miss this racing thing, though. Don't care how you do it, you gotta miss it. Oh, I uh, think he does. Is gonna, yeah. Lester's got a question. What amount of the spring split typically works best on the front end of a USRA B mod? Are running 550s even now, but pushing on corner entry and really bad in the center while braking? Well, I don't actually think the. 
Uh, you know, I, I, I can tell you to soften up that left front would make the car probably a little bit better on corner entry, but I don't, what's actually causing the problem on corner entry is the right rear sticking too hard. Uh, I still would possibly raise the panard bar, put more angle in that right rear trailing arm to get the car to roll a little bit better. Um, you, you softening the spring is definitely the answer. I'm just not, you know, sometimes the problem with that is, is now all of a sudden we can get a tightness in the middle of the corner because that, you know, that 550 is keeping that left rear hooked a little bit more. But as a rule of thumb, uh, once again, uh, under braking, if it's really bad under braking, that's a situation where I'm not so sure you don't have a brake situation that's going on. Uh, and, and that would tell me if it's under braking conditions and it's worse, that's telling me that the right rear of the car is sticking too hard. Uh, you need to put some traction in that right rear. Uh, what's you guys' opinion? Pretty spot on. Okay, next one. Joel, can you talk about what's needed to order your upper control arms, primarily for the racer that buys a used car with close uppers on it if they want spares? Um, Myself or all my uh, sales guys can turn the part was like what you're looking for. You know, there's a lot of a lot of options, a lot of areas there. But you know, we do this stuff today and we'll just a little bit of conversation like for what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, I encourage you to give us and take care of looking for. It. Um. That didn't come across really great as far as your internet or your, your we're still having some problems there, Joel. Biggest thing what I would do, Jason, is I'd give Joel a call tomorrow morning and he can, you know, at Close Racing Supply, and he can kind of give you an idea, you know, because you're probably going to need some measurements where he can, you know, if you tell him what brand of car you've got, he can tell you what you need. Hey, since we're talking to Jason Civils, let's talk yeah. about his creation. Awesome. So this Let's is our, our new product release for the night here. Uh, this is our Jason Civils inspired Sipe setter. So this thing fits uh, right on your Van Alstine Sipe head. Uh, and one of the cool things about it is you can you can set your blades at an angle. So angle siping is kind of a new trend where you can have your your first block uh, deeper and then go shallower as the block goes on to give your your trailing blocks some strength. So. This guy here is is engraved every sixteenth of an inch. If you can see that, so you just loosen the knob up, set it to whatever depth you want. If you want to be flat, or if you want to be on an angle, you can put the you know deeper on one side than the other side. And then if you don't have a Van Alstine or you have an old school sight pad, you just take this little block out, spin him around, and then you can set your grooving. Your grooving blades from the other direction if you want to use this tool for that so it's kind of a dual purpose we designed it for the van alstein and then we went to the track and and the guys are like well i can use the other side to do my groovers so uh kind of a dual purpose setter tool for for setting your depths on your your cypers and your groovers so just a really cool uh trick little piece that jason brought to us to to make for the racers and uh real nice and clean affordable 40 bucks they should be on the shelf at Close and BHE soon, I would think. Oh, yeah. <laughs> now that we know about it, we will get some of them coming. Um, okay. Bob wants, can you talk about running the left rear chain on a street stock, stock car type of car? I've heard people having success with with one on the on a dry stick racetrack. Um, well, the thing is with that, Bob, is anytime you can limit, in, in my opinion, you, you limit a little bit of movement on that left rear, 
it, it takes steer out of the car. And sometimes if you get too much steer, you get too much hike on the left rear, what's happening is, is then all of a sudden the car gets so much steer that it steers the car loose. So a lot of times people on dry stick racetracks will actually shorten that chain a little bit to try to take some of that steer out of it. Um, you still have the load in your spring. Everything else is the same. The only thing of it is, is you're not gaining any additional trailing arm angle. So trailing arm angle is actually what gives you traction. So sometimes it's kind of a catch-22. Uh, that's one of those deals, Bob, you just need to try it and see what you think. Um, you know, if, if you can go with more angle on the trailing arm, I think that's a plus. Okay, Tyler's got Jet by BHE or GRT by BHE. What do you prefer? Well, we've only done, you know, the only car that we did as far as um, Johnny's cars, the Jet car, uh, was the one that we did for uh, Cade Richards. Uh, Cade's a kid that, man, he, uh, we've, been, we've been helping him since he, he's, you know, almost since he started racing and he bought a jet car and wanted to know if, if we could put our front end on the car and Johnny was okay with it. So we did it to kind of help Kate out. Um, we're just kind of waiting to see what goes on. Johnny's cars are good race cars and I'm not saying that, that we would need to put our front end on Johnny's cars. I mean, his stuff's going very well. Um, so, you know, as far as the, the two cars go, you know, we built a lot of GRTs, but like I said, that's kind of what we, uh, um, you know, what we've actually promoted the most. Um, and once again, nothing wrong with Johnny stuff. Johnny stuff's good stuff the way it is. All right, next question. Chad, you should make something to measure from the mid plate to the rear end to measure squareness or to see where you're at using plumb bob, using plumb bob suck. Well, that's what I just went and grabbed. I grabbed a, a WM448. Dan Long came to me a couple years ago to, to make a tool that goes on the axle uh, that snaps on there and then it gives you the, the center line notch. So that snaps on the rear end and then when you get the level, level, then you have a notch for center line and edge of the tube both directions so you can have a vertical so you can do ground up to the center ground up to the edge front to back so this is just a quick little tool that snaps over the axle tube to let you know where center is uh, so you don't have to use the plumb bob hanging over the edge wm448 awesome um bryce uh wait a minute sorry i missed one ryan how far out are you from ordering a new stock car chassis I can't completely answer that question 100% with accuracy. Um, I'm going to say 45 days probably is what I'm guessing, 30 to 45 days. Um, I know we have one on order uh, that is not sold, and I think we're supposed to get that car here the end of this week or the first part of next week sometime. Uh, it's a car that we want to kind of take a little bit of extra time with and go through some things and and kind of make some adjustments to it um, just so that it's, it's, it's a little bit more, has more BHE trickery to it. So to, I'm going to borrow your phrase there, Chad, uh, a little bit more trickery to, to it. Um, Nothing against the the uh, BMW cars the way they are. They all work very well. Um, you know, we're just wanting to give our customers uh, uh, a couple different takes on some things. So you, you, you'd be best, Ryan, to give Bobby a call tomorrow on that, and he can kind of give you a, a little better idea. He's kind of our stock car guy. And when it comes to some of that stuff, I – I keep up with the details on the actual car itself, but I don't necessarily keep up with the other details so much. Hey guys, thanks again. My question today is a four link toe. Uh, with the car at attitude, should the right side 
links be pointed straight forward and the left side be towed towards the right front? If so, what angles should you recommend? Go ahead, Chad. So the, the left, as you're sitting there statically at right eye, you want the left sides to be fairly straight forward. Uh, the, the left rear gets a lot of motion, so then we're going to go through a, a big transition. Uh, so you want to always double check your bars uh, statically and an attitude. And when I say attitude, left rear down, right rear up in the wheel well. The right side bars, uh, the right bottom rod, basically the car teeters over the right bottom rod. So that, that's the, the bar that has the least movement. So we basically start that one pretty straight. Uh, the right top rod needs to be pointed to the left front tire probably about an inch, I would say, Bob, right? Yeah, that's what I would say. An inch is probably a good starting point, uh, and that's that's often overlooked. I had a customer uh, in Vegas a few years back that couldn't figure his car out, and he was just struggling, and, and nothing he did uh, seemed to help the car. So I went over there and kind of did a, a look over on it, and one of the first things I noticed was his bar toe. His right top rod was pointing out at ride height. Well, when it's pointed out at ride height and it rolls over and it points to the door, uh, an attitude like that, when you pick up the fuel, the, the motion goes through them rods, and basically with the right top rod pointed to the door, it was the car was always tight. And then what it turned out to be was he just had his frame spacer switched from what the, the car builder had recommended. So it was about a... I think it was about a two or two and a half, three inch swing on that top rod once he flipped them spacers around and it was like night and day uh, handling. So Bartow is often overlooked uh, and always should be addressed and, and uh, make sure that you got it right. Okay. I need to make a drawing for that, Bob. What'd you say? I need to make a Bartow drawing. You do. I agree. That's a, that's, you need to put your main man on that project. Let's see if Billy's got some time. Yeah, there you go. Well, tell him, you know, there's certain things that are important. Uh, GRT IMCA modified on 3 8 mile racetrack. Picks up a bad throttle push in the middle of the corner. I think it may be on the right rear too hard. Not enough right front. Where should I start? Um, first thing I would do is put a half inch wheel spacer. Well, if you're running a three inch off right rear, I'd put a half inch wheel spacer on there. Uh, I think that probably is going to help a, a fair amount. Um, next thing you could do, because you're right, uh, I mean, that's a common occurrence. The GRT cars get on the right rear pretty hard. Um, raising that panard bar up on the rear end would be a good another good idea because they like I said they they are it's common for them to roll on the right rear pretty hard. Um, but that wheel spacer raising the panard bar up if that doesn't quite cure it, always raise your right lower arm uh, on the frame. That's definitely going to help. Um, that would be my last thing to do unless. Uh, unless you're running a downhill angle on that right lower, then raise it so that it's actually level, so that when it does roll, it doesn't gain so much downhill angle. Uh, Bobby McKenzie is watching. Uh, Matthew, right rear spring on top of the rear end versus on a slider on a USRA B mod. Well, when you put the spring on top of the housing, what that does is basically just transfers the load from the rear, you know, from the frame to the rear end. It doesn't have anything to do with uh, any rear end movement as far as, you know, any pinion movement whatsoever. Um, slider, in, in my opinion, a slider on the right rear in front of the housing is going to drive a little better. Uh, it's going to be a little more tunable, but if you're on like running some real rough racetracks and stuff, uh, that spring on top of the housing is pretty hard to beat because it, once again, it doesn't, it has no effect when the, when the car, when your pinion angle comes up and the throttle comes up and you get steer in the car and it's changing your pinion angle, it's not changing the actual spring angle. It's your spring is just up there on top of the housing. Uh, Dan, 
is a six and a quarter rake too much on the left rear J bar with at the pinion one inch above the drive shaft? No, actually not. I think you're in good shape there. Uh, that's six and a quarter inches is exactly where I would sit. Uh, Alex, I took my stock car, I took the stock car hobby class last and got our first win on Friday. Well, way to go, Alex. Um, make sure you email us tomorrow so that we can put you on the winners list. Uh, that's pretty awesome. And, and let, uh, let us know where you ran, where you won at. That's pretty cool. Congratulations. Uh, my question is, I race a 3,100-pound pure stock, stock rear suspension on American Racer tires. The right rear is rolling under too far, and after two races, the tread on the right rear starts to separate the sidewall where it's glued. Separate the sidewall where it's glued together. I'm at 14 pounds of air pressure and still rolling it under. Um, man, with that heavy of a race car, you you really that right rear needs to be in that 16 range. Um, I'd keep putting air in it until it, you know, yeah, that's 14 pounds is is I wouldn't run 14 pounds on a 2400 pound modified car to be honest with you. Um, that's 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 pretty light. Uh, will adding more pounds of pressure like the 16 make the big difference to solve that or should I lower should I lower the weight to the stop the rollover of the car well before you let's try the 16 pounds of air pressure first before you lower the weight because if first of all I'd hate to see you change a lot of stuff because if you won that's a pretty good indication you were going pretty good but uh, let's try the air pressure first and if that doesn't solve it you probably will have to do something about that me now i can hear you now wow maybe i fixed it took me uh 50 minutes into the show to get it fixed but maybe i got on the right track now that's well, way better. the picture's a lot better and your sound is really good Perfect. You again? so what did you do no. to fix it well i i shut off my laptop and, and got on my phone and figured out how to do it there, but it uh, seems to be working all right. I apologize for that. Yeah, no problem. No signal we have suffered through our share of technical difficulties in this show. <laughs> this would not be the very first one, by all means. Uh, Back up to that A-frame. My, my computers made it through all night without any glitches, so what the heck? Don't feel bad, Joel. Not a <laughs> problem. Uh, Kevin... Is there a disadvantage of picking up the left front? Chassis manufacturers made suggestions to tighten the right front, to tighten the right rear chain a little bit, which corrected the left front, but the car seems to turn better with the left front in the air. Uh, should I allow the left front to come up more or allow to left front to come up more or make other adjustments to coincide with tightening the right rear chain well I'm not a I, I, I'm not just a super duper fan of tightening that right rear chain uh, I'm not saying it doesn't produce traction because it, it does produce traction um, but I don't understand why the car you would think with the left front on the ground, the car would actually turn in better. So I'm not really sure. You guys have an opinion? Yeah, you would think. I mean, the old adage used to be four tires should be better than three, but. Yeah, I would be careful with the right rear chain for sure. Yeah, that um, definitely gets you up off the corner a little better, but if it's a little bit rough or choppy, you won't like it. Okay. Uh, Junior, uh, got a 16 GRT IMCA modified. What do you recommend for Panard bar split? Um, on a GRT, I actually try to run the panard bar about an inch above the center of the rear end the center of the pinion on the rear end 
and then a six inch rake. Now, you can adjust the rake depending on if you need more left rear traction. The problem is, is sometimes uh, you, you can gain a little traction by putting more rake in it, but then you can lose traction off the corner. Nice. It might help it in the middle, but sometimes it can hurt the car off the corner. Um, what's your guys' experience, what's your experience, Joel, with that rake in the Panhard bar? Well, once again, you know, me dealing with, uh, you know, more UMP stuff and, and less IMCA stuff, I think, I think that makes a difference. But, uh, you know, centerline opinion a little bit above and, yeah, six, six and a half inches of rakes, I think is pretty common. That, Adjust accordingly from there. Yeah, that seems to be pretty much what, what, what I've found. Um, Since we got Joel, you want him to talk about them A-frames? Yeah, go ahead and talk about those A-frames. Tell, tell us that story again that we lost you on. Okay. Um, if I remember correctly, I think Jason was asking me how uh, what the best way for guys to order A-frames that maybe had bought some used cars that had uh, CRS uppers on it. Um, you know, we just encourage people to give us a call at the shop. You know, you can talk to myself or a couple of my sales guys, and uh, we can decipher what you need. Um, whether we look up a, a previous sale to another customer uh, that maybe owned that car, um, we usually can decipher it. You know, there's actually a lot of options and lengths and different things like that, but we do stuff every day. So we're accustomed to figuring out what people need. And then last resort, we have people send us pictures, you know, that we could figure out from. So we're always able to take care of the customer um, on, on upper A-frame stuff. So we just encourage them to give us a call. And now, and your upper A-frames use your ball joint. Yes, yes. It's a, main, a small diameter ball joint that uh, we had manufactured years ago. It actually started with uh, with Brian Ruhlman out of Michigan and his brother Chad Ruhlman. Um, Chad, uh, good friends of mine, um, local to us, the Ruhlmans are, and so it was a collaboration with all these guys that had, had made that eight, or that ball joint, and I want to say we're going on 11 or 12 years we've been using that ball joint, and, and we've had a lot of success with it, and, and obviously the reason for that is is to give the right front, uh, you know, more shock clearance, run more uh, negative camber, and, and not worry about beating that shock up, and, and it's definitely done that, you know, um, and we've, uh, it's it's exceeded our expectation as far as the, the the strength and durability and it's just gotten very popular for us throughout the years this is show and tell you can go grab one and show it you're in the <laughs> showroom i go all the time and grab it I've done <laughs> all right i can do that hold tight all right uh kyle what's the pros and cons of spacing the left front in or out on a stock car um well anytime you, you when you 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 spacer it in, the car is going to want to turn down in a little better. Uh, however, a lot of times spacering it out actually makes the front end of the car wider, which makes the car a little bit more stable. But as a rule of thumb, if you spacer that in, uh, it's going to make that wheel is going to gain weight, and that is going to make the car turn down in, in the middle of the corner a little bit better. Go ahead, Joel. All right, so, yeah, so our small ball joint deal kind of looks like this right here, if you could see it. Um, we got a few different lengths. You know, this, I think, is a standard length. Uh, they come in a, a plus half, a plus one, a plus one and a half. Um, I brought, you know, our, our ball joint holder that has a clevis tab and, and a five-eighths threaded stud on it, um, which is one of our, one of our options. Um, but the, the pin just kind of drops down in there like that. Um, we have these caps uh, available in aluminum or steel. Uh, I believe the IMCA guys have to run a steel cap, and that cap just screws down on in there. Um, set the set the load on that thing, and then there's a couple set screws that kind of tighten that uh, tighten that cap up. So it's it's pretty easy uh, easy to use, easy to replace the pin, um, and, and once again, pretty durable and uh, helps to get that gain that extra uh, shot clearance on that right front. Um, I know Bob uses a, on a lot of his cars that particular uh, ball joint holder that I was showing. Um, and then we build that same uh, configuration in all kinds of different uppers, uh, adjustable style. Um, we use some of Chad's adjusters on the end that uh, go in the end of the A-frame uh, that the rod end goes in, three-quarter to half deal. Um, so lots of variations, uh, lots of options, um, but they all use that same style pin. Awesome. Good information. Um, 
Okay, what would the benefit of lowering the left front shock mount on a B mod be? Well, um, I actually don't see the the benefit would be is you would get more roll to the right rear. However, when you get more roll to the right rear, you take load off the left rear. So what we've actually done in the past, is we've actually raised the shock mount on the frame to the point where we can select it to the point where it can only get to the right rear so far when it bottoms out the shaft of this, or the, the shock absorber. So the trend has actually been to go the opposite way. Uh, we're running out on time here, so I'm hoping we get to all the rest of them. Um, hypothetically, if you had four offsets on a Northern Sport Mod and went to three offsets, what would the car do on all four corners that change the same? Uh, if you went from fours to threes, you're going to find that the car is actually just going to be more stable. It's not going to roll as much in the middle of the corner. Um, going to a three on the right rear is going to free that car up a little bit more. You're going to probably want to put a little more panic bar in it. Uh, you're going to want to do some things to tighten it up. Um, but... In, 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 you know, by by moving the right front out, you're kind of counteracting what it's going to do to the right front because the right front's going to resist a little of that roll. I would think the car would be very neutral and wouldn't probably change a tremendous amount. Uh, it's just going to be more stable. Um, Jacob, thanks again, Chad, for making the load length stick. If anyone is one. If anybody is wondering, it's worth the extra money indefinitely. Well, thanks, Jacob. Definitely a cool tool. You missed the master cylinder one. I did. Master cylinders, what ones for the front and for the rear? Uh, one inch to the front and one inch to the rear. Okay. All right, this next one, Adriel has got revisit rear bar toe on a three-link car. Uh, modified and how it affects it. Should the right rear be pointed towards the left front? If so, what angle? Well, as a rule of thumb, the way we build our cars is we take the left rear and it's angled. I can't give you the actual degree of angles because I don't know. But in inches wise, on a 16 inch bar, the left rear is angled towards the right front two inches. So if you drew a string line down the car, the right front or the, the left rear is pointed towards the right front two inches. The right rear is pointed towards the left front one inch. And that's what we've worked out. I and mean, that's what we've used pretty, pretty regularly here for uh, years. And that's worked out pretty well. Um, Dan, USRA B mods, quick change rear end. What hole would you run the right front trailing arm on the bracket of the left rear on the housing? Um, right rear, right rear car, uh, two link car. I'd start in the middle, four and a half down. Yeah. That's that's what I was going to say. I think that sounds like a good idea. Uh, Bryce says we need to have you back, Joel. So we'll have to do that again. Have you I don't back. know if I can take striking out again. <laughs> next, time we'll, next time we'll know to use your cell phone. There you go. You're so far from humanity there, you can't get internet out there. <laughs> there you go. You're probably right. Oh, man. That hurt, by the way. I was trying to figure out. I don't think my cell phone worked in your building, so it's amazing that your cell phone works. Yeah. Yeah, um, we'll work on that for next time for sure. Logan, 
How much left or chain drop do you recommend on a US RAB mod? Um, four and a half inches. Uh, that seems to work pretty good. Joel at CRS is an awesome guy and to deal with, and I love having giving him my money. Rick, Rick Halson. Oh yeah, Rick. Thanks a lot, Rick. Appreciate it. Appreciate your business. Okay. Uh, run CSR. Keaton Atkinson says, run CSR uppers on my car and have only bent one in three years. Great job. Well, Keaton must not hit much stuff. <laughs> That's pretty good. He's a heck of a driver. Um, Earl, your yours needs to be towed to the left front like four inches and the right rear LOL. Um, I was trying to find the Bob said we missed a question. I can't find it, but it said we missed a question from Austin. I'm not sure where it is. I couldn't find it going back, but uh, yeah, I said missed a question. You get in the heat race, losing the feature. I was going to ask the same question. If I missed the answer, I'll go back and rewatch it. Um, well, I'm sorry I can't find that question that Austin asked. Um, at the beginning of the night, the car is the heat race, but loosen the feature. Well, the problem is, of course, you know, heat races have a tendency to be grippy. So, you know, you're going to have to do, you know, a, well, there's just a, 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 quite a few things that you could actually do. I'm not really sure what to actually tell you. Um, for sure to go to. Um, I know like an IMCA car, we lengthen the left side wheelbase a quarter of an inch for feature time to keep the car so that it comes up off the corner a little straighter, take a little static steer out of it. That seems to work really well. Um, other things you could do, uh, what's your suggestion, Joel? Yeah, I mean, I would tell somebody to, first of all, check with their you know, chassis, uh, builder what his recommendations are because there's obviously many things to do um and they're going to point you in the right direction with with the type of car you have um but yeah taking some static steer out that's that's always a really good tuning tool you know um even you know uh wheel spacer you know slide on half inch three quarter one inch wheel spacers are a good tuning tool uh for these lower division cars between heat and feature many other items but there's a couple small items that help you know um chad Jonathan's got a question on biscuits. How long they last in the pull bar and when should you service them? Well, the thing is, is Jonathan, we need to know he's, he's got a rage car, so you should probably have an idea. Yeah, it's probably uh, a small puck bar. The small puck ones in the can, generally 20 nights, uh, they need to be probably thrown away and, and put a fresh set in. Uh, our bigger biscuit, on an IMCA crate motor, that thing will last. Uh, well, we got some guys over 60 nights on that one. Um, the big biscuit on an open tire car, you know, the the open motor, big blade, sticky tires, that stuff hurts the hurts the pull bar biscuits. If you're IMCA 604 crate racing, you're going to get more longevity out of it. So it's kind of based on <clears throat> how much material, uh, how much puck material you have and how big a horsepower you got, how sticky of a tire, and how much grip you got. That depends on how hard you are on those biscuits. More material lasts longer, so our bigger, our big puck biscuit lasts a lot longer than the small pucks. Um, Logan wants to know where you measure the chain drop. Um, measure your, your distance from the uh, axle. Well, if you have an over rail car, Measure your distance from the top of the axle housing to the bottom of the frame, and then jack it up so that there's an additional four and a half, four to four and a half inches of chain of, of more clearance there, and then hook your chain there. In fact, I'd probably go four. Because, uh, like, say, if your measurement is, we'll give you an example, if your measurement is 13 inches, um, raise it up to a 17 inches and then hook your chain up there. 
Um, you're going to have to help me out with this next one, Joel. Uh, what rear brake pads do you recommend for a sport mod? What we run is the AFCO really aggressive ones. I think the part number ends in 34. Does that sound right? Yeah, the 34 pad AFCO pad is the pretty aggressive one that you'd want to run on a rear for sure. Um, that's the one that we we sell that one quite a bit, and then uh, Willwood's fairly aggressive pad. What's that one? Um, These guys are asking me to be a parts guy. Hell, yeah. I don't need parts. So that's why that, I got parts guys for. Yeah, I know that BP40 Willwood pad's a pretty. Yeah, that's it. That's the number I've heard. Yeah, BP40 is pretty. Uh, Pretty popular pad in the Willwood for sure. Yeah, that's the two we sell. Sorry, guys, I don't actually get the play privilege of talking on the phone to you guys in a whole lot anymore. I've got guys that do such a better job at it than me that I let them do their work and I don't mess with them. Between Austin and Bobby, they take care of Rocky, they take care of pretty much all the sales calls. Okay. All right, we've got. We're gonna do two more questions. Austin, is it good? It was good in in the good intact. Move right side down for the slick and isn't near enough. What other adjustments? Once again, Austin, I'd recommend uh, lengthen the left side wheelbase. Um, Yeah, closing the stagger up a little bit. Uh, that would probably be my two first things I would go to. Uh, Bob, his question was, oh, yeah. Well, we got you, Bob. Thank you very much. Uh, Adriel, Bob, was the left rear, right rear bar angle measurement from the right heights? Hmm. What was Adriel's question? I th think it was static angles. Yeah, that would be at right height, correct. Um, basically, like if you look at the back of the car, you, you go forward and in two inches. If you look at the back of the, of the right side, yeah, he was talking about toe. All right, guys. Well, I apologize. Uh, sorry, Joel, we didn't get you enough time on here, but we will definitely have you back. And uh, uh, it's been a great, a great group of questions again tonight. Um, anything else you got, Chad? Not really. Just everybody have a good week. Good luck this weekend, Joel. Good to see you again. Yep. Thanks for having me, guys. You bet. All right. Well, thanks, guys. We appreciate it. And you guys have a good week. And, and like I said, that, that Stucker guy, make sure you send us an email tomorrow so we know where you won. And, and definitely uh, sounds good. All right. Everybody have a great night. Thank you. Thanks.